Pastor. Amen. Thank you again for the invitation to be with you this this tonight on my end. It's um, just after 10, it's 10 or 7 and it's in the morning for you. Um, it's a privilege to be with you today. Indeed, I've heard much about this online platform, this particular group, and I'm blessed and privileged to be with you today. Indeed, it is um, it's just wonderful to see God's people gathering together to support each other, to encourage each other, to edify each other, to, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so I thank God for you. Today, I want to share with you and that I was preaching in a church and I was a witness to a miracle of someone coming back to life who had no pulse, um, was not breathing, and the church knelt and prayed together. And before the paramedics, the emergency medical services personnel came, he was revived. Um, and so I praise God for the experience that we had, um, I should say yesterday, because the day starts at, 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 at sunset. And so we, I, I, I just thank God for that experience today to remind me that he still works today, that miracles still exist and God still brings people back to life. It's not something um, ancient, but even in our current uh, context, God is still working um, for us. Happy Mother's Day to the mothers um, this morning. Um, may God bless you. May God keep you. And to the bereaved, I extend my condolences to you. I know it's tough, difficult, but we have the hope in the resurrection. Uh, let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you this day for the privilege is to open your word and to be blessed, to be encouraged, to be edified, Lord, uh, to be instructed and to be inspired. And so, Lord, I pray that as we, as we go through this week under the caption, when God interrupts, that each one of us not only will be challenged, but convicted. And Lord, by choice, may we commit ourselves to even a deeper experience with you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 as we begin our series, Jeremiah chapter 1. And I want to read in your hearing verse number, starting in verse 4, and we will conclude in verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, and I will read in your hearing from the New King James Version. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through Nine, And it reads thus, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you to you a prophet to the nations. Then I then said, I, our Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm a youth for you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I'm with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And so today we are talking about when God interrupts. When God interrupts, let's pray, Father, again, we want to thank you for the privilege it is to open your word. We pray that you'll speak to us from this encounter between yourself and Jeremiah. May we be encouraged today in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you this morning, but I am not someone who likes being interrupted. It doesn't matter whether I'm talking or in the middle of doing something. Many of us, including myself, don't like being interrupted. Interruptions mean having to stop what you're doing and adjust to the interruption. If we want to encounter God, we, had better, we have to be prepared for interruptions. The Bible says many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is a Lord's purpose that prevailed. God has a habit of interrupting us. Time and time again through the Bible, we see examples of where God interrupts what a person is doing and asks them to adjust to something different. Abraham was com comfortable in the Ur, Ur of the Chaldees, but God called him on a journey of faith. Moses was comfortable herding sheep in the wilderness, but God's people needed a deliverer. 
Jonah was comfortable preaching in Israel, but Nineveh needed to hear from God. Nehemiah was comfortable as a king's cup bearer, but the walls of Jerusalem needed to be rebuilt. Mary was comfortable living her young, simple life, but angel Gabriel interrupted her and brought her a life-altering message. Peter was comfortable as a fisherman, but Jesus saw another purpose for his life. Paul was comfortable as a Pharisee, but God needed a great church planter. When God interrupts, it often leads to enormous changes, adjustments in our lives. It can be men leaving family and friends, moving to foreign countries of mission. It may mean having to leave behind life's goals and change them for the sake of following God's lead. I was interrupted one spring afternoon in Brooklyn, New York, where I lived at the time, as, we were pre as I was preparing to enter a board meeting through the, through the instrumentality of another board member, God interrupted my life and changed the course of my life and aligned it more squarely with his divine purpose, uh, purposes. I'm here today because God interrupted my life. I was comfortable being an elder, comfortable being a men's ministry leader, comfortable in Pathfinders, comfortable in my local church, comfortable in the job I had at the hospital where I worked. But that spring afternoon in Brooklyn, New York, God used another elder to interrupt me and change the course of my life. Here in the book of Jeremiah, we find Jeremiah having a dialogue with God, an interesting dialogue. And the reason that we begin this series with Jeremiah is because I believe that in, in, in the interaction, the, the conversation between Jeremiah and God, there are many things that we can learn about God and how he interrupts us and what he asks of us and how we should be ready to respond to him. Most prophetic books provide little or no information about the life of the prophet. In contrast, the stories about the life of Jeremiah comprise one of the signature features of the book that bears his name. In this book, we have narratives about his imprisonment, commitment to God's command, not to marry or have children, persecution, false accusations of treason, forced exile to Egypt, destruction of a manuscript by King Jehoiakim and an unfruitful search for just one righteous man. This, this is a job that Jeremiah neither seeks nor welcomes. Jeremiah is the son of a priest. We have no evidence that he ever performed priestly functions, but we can be sure that he was well-trained in religious matters, understood the priestly function, but God did not call him to be a priest. He was calling him to be a prophet. And let me pause to say this, just because my family may be in, a, in a, a specific tradition in terms of vocation. It does not mean that that's what God wants me to do. My dad was a lawyer who became a judge, who became chief justice in the country where I was born. And therefore everybody expected that I would be a lawyer, my brother would be a lawyer, and neither of us are lawyers, my sister is, but neither sons are. God called us to be ministers. And these verses that tell us of the call of Jeremiah, which is similar in, in several ways to the cause of Moses, Gideon, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all of these report an encounter with God, a commission to do God, God's will or speak his word. It is a word from the Lord. The Bible says, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, behold, before I formed you in the, your, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you to be, ordained your prophet to the nation. It's easy to underestimate the power of a word. Words have the power to encourage or discourage, heal or to wound. The words of a great visionary or orator have the power to stir crowds, build or, to build or mobs to destroy. We can, might be tempted to think dismissively about words. They're only words we say, but, but the Hebrews would not make that mistake. They understood that words led to actions, produced results, and had consequences. God says, before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you. He says, I appointed you. 
The Hebrew word there, Nathan, means to give, to put, or place, or to make. The use of this word in this context suggests something more than the bestowal of a title or the appointment and office. God has given Jeremiah the gift that he was now used. He gave him the gift of prophecy. He had to put in him that which makes him a prophet. He had made him or shaped him in such a way that being a prophet is what he was called to be. But yet, Jeremiah, after God tells him, I formed you in the womb. I sanctified you and I ordained you to be a prophet. Jeremiah protests. Jeremiah says, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for him a youth. It's not unusual for those who God interrupts and with whom he shares his purpose for interrupting to resist or to protest. Oh, we recall that at the burning bush, Moses says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? After some additional dialogue and considerable reassurance, Moses protested, oh Lord, I am not eloquent, neither Neither before now nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Exodus 4 and verse 10. It is not unusual to protest when you understand what God is calling you to do. I recall in my own experience when I realized what God was calling me to do, to leave, asking me to leave Brooklyn to go to Barron Springs, Michigan to leave behind family and friends and familiarity, uh, that I, I, I try to find a way to, to, to say to God that I could still serve him where I was, that I could do online, not online class, but distance learning. And that's what it was called then, distance learning, and still meet the requirements. But oh no, God did not have that uh, for me. He did not accept that. And therefore, he made it absolutely clear that I had to leave the familiarity of the life that I had in New York and go to the unfamiliar territory of Bering Springs, Michigan. And by the way, I might say that every day that I was in Bering Springs, I enjoyed it. Because I, I say to you, when you are where God wants you to be, there's a joy that he puts in your heart that makes every day every day, even though it has challenges, a day that brings satisfaction because you're where God wants you to be. When God calls Jeremiah, even though he protests, we discover here in verse seven, if you have your Bibles, he says, but the Lord said to me, do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I'm with you to deliver you, says the Lord. In the call of Jeremiah, when God interrupted his life, there are two, two things he required of him. First, that Jeremiah go to all to whomever he was sent. This is a frightening prospect sometimes because God is no respecter of persons. The person whom God chooses can expect to stand before the powerful often, sometimes, who are not, who are not prepared to hear what you have to say. But God expects you to go wherever he sends you. The second thing that God requires when he interrupts, uh, when he interrupted Jeremiah, and certainly in many of our lives when he interrupts us, is that God demands that we do whatever he commands us to do, whatever he commands us to say. And so we find that in the Bible, we find that in the death of Uriah, Nathan had to tell David, you're the man. John the Baptist had to criticize Herod for marrying the wife of his, bro his brother. Some had to speak uncomfortable um, words to others, but yet God expects us to speak what he commands. And as Adventists, there, there are things that God has commanded that we speak in these last days. And he expects us not only to go, but he expects us to speak what he has ordained for us to speak. 
As the book unfolds, Jeremiah it is, it is apparent that Jeremiah is called to deliver a message that is both difficult and unwelcome. The declaration that God knew him before he was born, even before he was formed in his mother's womb, does not exempt Jeremiah from the problems inherent in his ministerial core. Neither the command not to be afraid nor the promise of God's presence is enough to shield Jeremiah from the trouble that awaits him. Anticipating the, difficult, anticipating the difficulty may have been a part of the reason why Jeremiah objected to God's summons. And so tonight, that uh, this morning, for me, night, for you, morning, I want to say to you there are three things that we need to remember from this encounter with God. Number one, that God's plan for us precedes our birth. God's plans for us precedes our birth. And it is clear from verse four and verse five that it does, it is. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctify, I ordained you a prophet to the nation. I've often thought about this. That God had a plan for my life before I was formed in my mother's womb. You know, when, when I started out in life, there are many things that I, I wanted to, to, to be. At one point, I wanted to be a physician. Another point, I wanted to be a lawyer, um, but God had other plans. And I recall that at 12 years old, I was sitting in a Methodist church with my dad because I was Methodist then. And we were sitting, it was a Wednesday night, and um, Reverend Caleb Cousins from the country of Belize was the pastor. There were just about seven of us there. And I remember driving home with my dad and saying, dad, I want to be a pastor. That didn't sit well with him. He never encouraged me to follow that. It never came up again until I became an Adventist. At that time when I became an Adventist and I enjoyed being an Adventist, uh, that it came, the call came back again. And I remember um, being sure of it. I remember sharing it with my dad. I remember sharing that with my mother. Because what God had done the year before I started seminary, God sent me to Andrews on a, uh, for a two-week family life um, course. It's while on that campus, my friends, that God once again interrupted. You see, while I was there on that first day, there was a gentleman who came walking across the campus. I'd never seen him before, but he had seen me because he had visited my church in New York. And he first thing he said, he said, I know you, are you here to do the Masters of Divinity? And I said, no, I'm not here. I'm here for a family life um, course. He said, well, if you need anything, here's my number, give me a call. The next morning, as I was making my way out of the cafeteria, um, into the dining hall, so to speak. There was my master, my former master guide instructor, and he was sitting there and he, he saw me come and he said, hey, Bishop, um, are you here to do the Masters of Divinity at Andrews? I said, no, no, Leon, I'm not here for that. I'm here for this. And then on the last day, the, la the day before we concluded our course there, there's a gentleman from South Africa who was living in New Zealand at the time, and we were not in the same group, um, but he called me. He said, I need to speak to you. And he called me out of the class and he said, have you considered the masters of divinity? At that point, I knew after the third time that God was serious, that God wanted me to do. I went and I got the applications. I went back to New York. I told them I will not be taking elected office next year because I would not be there. They didn't take me seriously, but I was serious because I knew what God was asking of me. And in May of 2002, that was, I left Brooklyn for Barron Springs. God had interrupted my life and set me on course in alignment with his purposes for my life. 
But I want to believe that God's plan for my life preceded my birth. The second thing we need to remember tonight, that God's presence with us will help us to overcome obstacles that we face in the mission to which he was, he's assigned us. In verse number eight, in fact, verse number six, when Jeremiah says, ah, Lord, but I'm a youth, God says to him in verse seven, do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I'm with you to deliver you, says the Lord. When God calls us, when God interrupts us, he comes, but he does not, he does not say I will abandon you. When he comes, he promises to be with us. And so again, if tonight you have found yourself interrupted by God who is saying to you that there's something that I have for you to do, that very God who has interrupted you promises to be with you throughout the journey. So not first, God is with us. God's plans, God's purposes precede our birth. God's presence with us helps us to overcome obstacles. And thirdly, God expects, regardless of our vocation, that God's proclamation should be on our lips. Jeremiah 9 and verse 10 says, uh, Jeremiah 1 verses 9 and 10 says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Before, before Behold, I've put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and pull down, to destroy and throw down, to build and to plant. God expects that when he calls us, when he interrupts, uh, that whatever he's commanded us to do, that we will do. But he expects that whatever it is will be on our lips, wherever he sends us. So God's plan, plans precede our birth. God's presence helps us to overcome obstacles to our mission. And thirdly, God expects God, his proclamation should be on our lips. And for us who are part of the remnant, these three things we must remember. But more importantly, that in these days, God expects our proclamation to be on his proclamation to be on our lips. So tonight, as we lay the foundation of this morning, as we lay the foundation for this week, I ask you to remember these things. When God interrupts, he has a plan. When God interrupts, he has a purpose. When God interrupts, he has a promise. And when God interrupts, he's prepared to deal with our protests. But we must remember, when he interrupts, he'll provide what we need to accomplish his purpose. My question to you this morning, has God called you? Is he, has he, is he interrupting you? Has he interrupted you? How have you responded to him? Are you obeying his commands? Are you sharing his word? How have you responded to God's interruptions or interruption in your life? Somebody this morning has been interrupted by God. And somebody's wrestling with whatever he's placed on your heart because whatever it is, whatever he shared, Whatever he said is going to change your life. And you may be saying, Lord, how? But he promises, he promises that we ought not to fear because he will be with us. We ought not to fear because he will provide. I recall when God interrupted my life. And I looked at, even as an adult, concern about my parents' response. He'd already taken care of that. He said, son, whatever it is that God has called you to do, we'll support you. And they did for one year. He said, we don't want you to do anything. We'll support. And then one summer, just to show you how God provides. One summer, I went home and there was a notice saying that, hey, there's $9,000 available to me. And I said, where, from where? 
And I forgot that during my employment, I had saved $9,000 through the, and a program that they had for employees. And I forgot about it. And I told the woman she was not telling the truth. And she simply said, do you want your money or you don't? And so I, I filled out the form and there was $9,000 to help me to complete my course of study. When God interrupts, he's prepared to provide what is necessary for us to fulfill the purpose to which he's called us. And so there are three other things I want to share with you. And that is, number one, when God interrupts my plans of my life, there's, there are a couple of things we need to do. Sometimes we need to seek clarification. Uh, sometimes we need to seek confirmation. But when we have done clarification and confirmation, we need to commit to whatever it is that God has called us to do. This morning, I want to challenge you that as we go through the rest of our lives, prepare that the God who interrupted Jeremiah will interrupt us. And when he does, just remember that he's prepared to provide what is necessary for us to complete his purposes. I pray that God will bless you as we go through the rest of this week, as we look at various characters and how God interrupted them and how they responded and what we can glean from their responses to God. And I pray that by the end of this week together, we will learn that indeed God is serious when he interrupts us, but then we have a choice as to how we respond to his interruptions. Let us pray. Father in heaven, this morning, as we've gathered together to consider um, when God interrupts, as we begin the, this series, as we have completed our first installment in this series, we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to reflect on our own lives and how you've interrupted and when you interrupted, how we responded, how we reacted. And I pray that, Lord, through this week, Lord, we will realize that when you interrupt, you're not seeking to destroy us, you're not seeking to harm us, but you're just bringing us to the place where we are aligned with a purpose that you predetermined for us. Father, I pray that each attendee this morning will recommit to you and submit their hearts so that you may have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.